Everyone has unique contribution that they can make. And if we focus our attention on enabling people to make their best contribution by providing a context in which it can be successful, it can be effective for them to achieve their fulfillment of their identity, then it changes the nature of the society that we have to be a society that we truly depend on each other. Hello, damn givers. Welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. I'm Nick LaPara, and on this show, I, along with my incredible guests, we explore what it looks like to live a meaningful life. Each one of my guests wants to leave the planet much better than they found it. Let's give a damn family. Thank you for showing up. I'm so glad you're here. My guest today is Yanir Bar-Yam. Friends, we have a legend in the house. Yanir is a scientist and activist specializing in the field of complex systems. Simply put, he is smarter than most people on planet Earth. He received his SB and PhD from MIT and has been working on incredible projects that have changed so many things in the world we live in since then. About 15 years ago, he began working on applying his work in physics and complex systems to pandemics. And a few years ago, his unique contribution helped end the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Yanir has advised the CDC, the Chairman's Action Group at the Pentagon, the National Security Council, the National Counterterrorism Council, and other government organizations, NGOs, and corporations. He is the author of Dynamics of Complex Systems, Making Things Work, and over 200 research papers in professional journals. His work has been described in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Sunday Times, Time Magazine, the Atlantic Monthly, Scientific American, Wired, Fast Company, Forbes, Slate, Mother Jones, Vice, and many, many others. And I'm honored to be working on a project right now called COVID Zero with Yanir. Our aim is to help as many people and places as possible, understand that we can get to COVID zero and we can move toward a new and better normal much sooner than the projections you see in government, in the media, and otherwise. We have a plan and a strategy in place that we have outlined at covidzero.us. Go check it out. Go there if you want to learn more and if you want to help out. We have many ways that you can help out, little ways, big ways, and everything in between. Before we begin, a quick reminder that you can, anytime and for any reason, email me at hello at letsgiveadam.com, including if you want to learn more about COVID-0. I'd love to hear from you. And now, let's get right into my conversation with Yanir Baryam. Let's go. Yanir, it's so good to have you on the Let's Give a Damn podcast. Welcome. Thank you. You and I, uh, this is a different kind of conversation because for most of my guests, some of them are friends of mine, but for most of my guests, it's people that I'm meeting for the first time. And you and I have seen quite a bit of each other this past, uh, these past few weeks. Um, you and I have been working together on a project that we've sort of titled COVID Zero, and we'll get into so much of that uh, here in a few minutes. But it's a joy to sort of talk with you about work, but not in the context of work, right? We're just going to like, we're just going to shoot the breeze for a little bit and talk about this stuff and hopefully help. We've had quite a few uh, pandemic conversations over the last year, you know, some with uh, scientists, some with doctors and all approaching it from different perspectives. This one is super unique. And if I'm being honest, looking at the full year and now being, you know, 10 months, 11 months into the pandemic, what you're going to share with people is of utmost importance always, but right now in January of 2021, this is the message that we need to hear. Uh, These are the hard things that we need to do. So I'm super thrilled uh, to have you on today. Thanks for taking time to be with us. Great. So let's begin. We'll we'll talk work in a second. We'll talk pandemic. We'll talk COVID-19 in a second. But even though we've been working together for a few weeks, I don't know much about your background other than like your professional bio. So let's learn a little bit about who you are and where you came from. Cause I'm always interested in, you know, you're obviously a very prolific, uh, renowned physicist. You've done a lot of incredible things in your life in the area of physics and science. 
Where did all that come from? So go back as far as you want to. Where did you grow up? What were some of the things that sort of shaped you into who you are today? Wow, that's a big uh, open door, right? So go for it. Um, so I actually grew up in the U.S. I was born in the U.S. My parents uh, came from Israel, um, and um, I was um, raised at a very joyous uh, childhood, um, and um, uh, I, I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a physicist. And the reason is presumably because my father is a physicist. So um, uh, uh, side note, being a physicist, son of a physicist, it tells you that it sometimes, um, it, it gives me a little bit of a different perspective on the world uh, than, uh, uh, than uh, others have. And, and maybe uh, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to see how other people see the world. I think that's a, that's a fair statement to make. Um, but I, I went into physics. Um, so uh, uh, this is a story that I don't know if we want to spend a lot of time on, but when I was a child um, in middle school, came back pictures from uh, Biafra. And nowadays people don't know what Biafra is, but Biafra is part of um, uh, Ethiopia and they seceded and there was a civil war and there was a drought and there were uh, horrendous pictures coming back. And um, at the time I had a little, uh, 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 I don't know, crisis of, of, of uh, thinking about what I wanted to do. And I debated whether I should go into, um, into global hunger instead of into physics. And um, the, uh, after a couple of weeks of sort of uh, uh, thinking about it, I decided that I would still go into physics, but I would go into a practical part of physics in order to help out with global development. And, and so I did, I went to MIT as an undergraduate and graduate student. And when I went through after my undergraduate, um, I indeed went into condensed matter physics, the study of electronic materials. Um, and uh, I was doing that for a few years and when I was a, uh, just became a postdoc, um, I went to a conference and spoke about what I was doing. Uh, it was about defects and surfaces of electronic materials. The details here are of course not important, um, but when I spoke about it afterwards, I talked with someone who was building computer chips and I said to him, does this help you? And he said, no, he says, we have heuristics, he said, which means he had rules of thumbs about how to do it. He didn't need all the theory that I developed. I was very disillusioned because the only reason why I was doing this was because I wanted to be helpful. And so I just decided at that moment that I was going to go into fundamental physics. And, and that's ironic because, in fact, by changing course and going into fundamental physics and studying some of the fundamental mathematics that we use, uh, it turns out that building out the fundamentals turned out to actually help a lot in, in practical world. Because what, what, we, what I discovered, and I'll explain this a little bit, is that when you understand something more basically, it actually gives you the right tools to understand the world. Mm. And the reason why this was true is because the math that we usually use in science, which is calculus and statistics, is flawed. So calculus assumes that things are smooth and statistics assumes that things are independent. And neither of those are true. There's a lot of dependencies in the world. And when you have dependencies, you can end up with sharp transitions from one kind of behavior to another kind of behavior because things do the same thing at the same time, like a panic or a market crash. And, and those things cannot actually be mathematically described when we use the standard tools of calculus and statistics. And, and in, in the process of going back into the fundamental ideas, it turns out that those tools, and it, the main tool was not developed by me, it was developed by 
a physicist named Ken Wilson in 1970 who was studying phase transitions like boiling water. And in doing so, he developed a new math because the existing math didn't describe what was happening. And, and, and that math is the core of what we call complex system science or complexity science. And, and so what we gained was a new fundamental way of doing math that also enabled us to describe things like market crashes and, um, and cognition in the brain and evolutionary dynamics and pandemics. Um, and so, so this has opened the door for me to work on a lot of very practical real world problems. And it turns out that those practical real world problems are, were things that I remember that I really wanted to, to work on. And so I've spent many years now um, uh, building understanding of uh, challenges including, as we talked about, market crashes, panic, uh, and uh, things like ethnic violence and pandemics. And uh, th that's that's really fascinating. And I want you to describe in a minute, uh, it, maybe a little more f fully, you know, this this idea of complex systems, right? Because you went on to, you know, work with your current organization, the New England Complex Systems Institute. Uh, but before we get to that, so there's one theme that I'm seeing so far, which is you, your ability to, you know, multiple times you've already described in your life, you know, by the time you got to post-doc work that you, you, you really were clear on what you wanted to do. When you found out that you weren't doing that or it wasn't affecting people in a certain way, you know, uh, that you, you changed, you changed it, or you, you got very specific, you know, you, uh, what age were you when you said that you saw those photos and thought, well, I'm going to go into world hunger. Uh, no, 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 I'm going to stay in physics because I can still do some of that work. Right. What, what, was, what age were you? I was probably in, um, I may have been in eighth grade. Yeah, that's what, that's wild. Most eighth, eighth graders aren't thinking that. So what was your, we'll move on from your family in a second, but I do want to ask, so your dad's a physicist. Um, what was the environment in your home that created, uh, you know, space and room for you to think like that, right? Because again, that has to be, some of that might be intuitive. Some of that might be just part of your personality, but a lot of that is taught as I'm, you know, I'm raising three little kids and so much of it is their own personality, but so much of it is, you know, me pointing them to good things in the world and, and bad things and saying, what do you think about that? Let's talk about that, you know, kind of opening them up to um, the good and the bad things in the world and that, that's shaping who they become. So what was sort of the environment in your home growing up that allowed you to, first of all, see these images and feel the way that you did, but then also have the, the self-awareness to say, no, actually, I can be more useful not going into solving world hunger, but actually staying in physics? That's a really complicated question, but I suppose, uh, so, so there's both a professional piece of this, but also an interpersonal piece of this. My mother is a developmental psychologist, um, uh, and she uh, really supported me in an awareness that I could do whatever I wanted to. It's super important to be aware of how, you know, when people grow up, to know that everyone has a tremendous ability and, and, and opportunity to contribute. Um, and, and I'm very much aware of um, the fact that the people that I interact with, they have unique capabilities. The idea of, you know, there's a really strong message that the society gives people most of the time that says, you know, we're all in this one dimension, right? There's your average GPA or your IQ or, or something that is the measure of your worth in the world. Right. And it, it's just so wrong because everyone has unique capabilities. And, and we see this in many domains. Like you see, you're right. I mean, the person who's a great basketball player is not a great baseball player, despite some people that think otherwise. Michael Jordan tried it and he failed that's miserably. Right. That's right. But the point is that, but that's just an illustration, right? You have, I mean, golf players, and but you have chess players and you have, and, and, and if you think about the way the real world works, um, there are a tremendous number of different things that people can do and can contribute to. And so it, it's much more like, you know, one of these superhero movies where each one has their superpower. 
than it is that there is this one dimension that everyone can be measured against. Um, and, and so within that framework, my mother uh, taught me, or, or it's not taught really, right? It's just re reflected that I had an opportunity to make a contribution that would be important. Um, but it wasn't the kind of thing that said that other people couldn't, right? It wasn't the putting me up while putting other people down. Sure. It was exactly not that way. It was about recognizing that I had unique abilities uh, and of course other people had too. Uh, and so, so that's part of it. Um, the other part of it is a little bit uh, more serious. I mean, my father came to Israel from Europe and his father was killed by the Nazis. Mm. Um, and so, um, and, and he grew up in Krakow, which is the location where Schindler's List was filmed. And, 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 and so there, there was also, of course, an awareness, though he didn't talk about it much, that the world is a fragile place. Mm. And, and that things can be quite a lot worse. And, and I think that that has led me to um, be aware of the need um, to be uh, sensitive to both the condition that people are in and that the opportunity to help. Mm. That's really powerful. Thank you for sharing both of those aspects. On the, you said something that caught my ear, my attention. You talked about how your mother um, instilled in you this idea that you could go on to do great things. And, you know, within reason, you could do anything, right? And, and also that you, you, you recognize that in education, that no two people are the same. And yet, so here's, here, we'll get into the big stuff pandemic wise here in a second, but I have this kind of this off topic question about education because you are very educated at this point in your life. Are we doing education wrong? Then yes, for, totally. For, you know, I've got three kids in school and I will tell you that, you know, I, I, I've talked to my wife about, uh, we've traveled quite a bit in our, since having kids, started having kids eight years ago. So we haven't been able to like really solidify how we want to do school. We've talked about homeschooling so we could, you know, really spend time on each one of them, not homeschooling them to take them out of anything, but just homeschooling them to give them the attention that each one of their personalities needs. My wife cannot and doesn't want to do that. So they're in school. Uh, and this has been a weird year, right? Doing school on Zoom. And, you know, I, I sit there and listen sometimes to the teachers and God bless them. They're underpaid, overworked. This is nothing against teachers. But to hear just the lack of energy and the lack of ingenuity and the lack of creativity for trying to, trying to talk to each kid the way that they need to be talked to, right? It's just, it's it's, we're talking to them all the same way. We're teaching them all the same way. And so we have to do, parents have to, it, it, it then puts a ton of work on us to come in afterward if we're going to put them in sort of a public school system or even, I mean, guys, private schools, maybe the same as well. Um, puts a lot more work on us to like, we have to go fix a bunch of shit. We have to go back and fix a bunch of stuff that maybe was taught to them poorly or they don't realize in some ways how unique they are, right? We have to go instill that in them more right. than more than they would if they were in an environment that taught them uniquely. So here's my question. You're obviously very educated. How do we, you already said we're doing it wrong. How can we in this sort of an environment, because we can't choose, not everybody can teach their kids at home or, or afford to send them to a school where they're getting this unique attention. How do we do it then so that we can give our kids the opportunity to uh, be around other kids and, but still realize that they are uniquely gifted. They are uniquely blessed with X, Y, and Z that if they maximize those things, they can go do some really awesome stuff in life. Yeah. So, so let me take a step back and talk about schools for a moment, because I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to say a couple of words about it. Please. The school system is, as we have it, is an industrial process, right? It's the production line, right? Grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. And then you get, a, you know, you, you have a quality control process at the end, which is your, your, your exams or whatever. And, Industrial processes are good for mass production, but are not good for unique creation um, or 
I mean, and it's not just creation, obviously, because you're not creating something. You're, it, it, it has the uniqueness comes from inside as well as from outside. Um, so, so we're doing the wrong thing. And, and my mother actually created new schools. She originated new schools that were um, uh, innovative in their. Um, so, 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 so this is a. Th there's a, a longer story here. But you asked me something very specific. And let me answer your question. Uh, and the answer is, first of all, we have to be aware that as parents, we do have some choices um, about the environments that our kids are in. And, 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 and exercising that uh, choice, those choices that we do have is important. And it can be, you know, uh, you know, sometimes it may be choosing to live in a place where the kids are going to go to a better school, right? I mean, those yeah. are kind of questions that we face. Um, the other um, aspect of it, though, is the interpersonal aspect. And at the interpersonal level, a key thing that happens is that every time someone does something, every time they are around, there is a feedback between your understanding of them and their understanding of themselves. And if we focus on, if, if our understanding of them appreciates their unique capabilities mm -hmm. and focuses on strength first, then it enables us to recognize and to express appreciation and that expression of appreciation is what forms their self-image, right? Because nobody knows themselves. Mm. They can't. They form that by how we are responding to them. And, and, and that's the way we can build their ability to aspire because we ourselves, by, by, by talking about them in their presence, to them or to others, we create their own expectations about themselves. Mm. Which is, I, I love that you just went both education, but there's also that parenting aspect that you brought in because that is so important, right? Because so many people cannot control the environment they're in. We, we There are some choices that we can make, but so many people are stuck where they are. Right. And it takes not just, not just self willpower, not just uh, making more money. Like there's a lot of factors in moving if I want to get to a better school. Sure. And so you take what life gives you, you make changes as you can. But then at the end of the day, there is that responsibility to speak words and behave in certain ways and do certain things that will help round out that whole experience, no matter what their education experience is. Absolutely. I love that. Super helpful. Okay. So let's Let's move on to um, complex systems. Um, what what is that? I mean, that's that's been your whole like world the last 30, 40 years, right? Yeah. And so what is that and how did it lead you? So so as you're telling this part of the story, how did it lead you into, you know, starting to work on pandemics 15 years ago, right? Which is in the bulk of your work. Like, how did your work evolve? And then once we get through this, we'll start talking about, you know, the the enormous nature of your work. Uh in the, in the past year. So complex systems, pandemics, Ebola, that whole part of your life. So, so the complexity science or complex system science is basically about using the right math to describe the world. And the challenge is that if you write down the wrong equations, which is what people usually think about, then, you know, you say, well, hey, I, I, I wrote the equations wrong. I can fix them. But what turns out to be the crucial part of it is actually writing down the right variables, what matters and doesn't matter. When you have a complex system and you can think about the world around you, there's just a lot of things going on. And when there are a lot of things going on, you, it's impossible to know everything. And so there are these two different kind of things that people do. One is they take a particular variable like the average height of people or the average wealth or something like that, which is the usual thing that you use in statistics. And at the other end, there's this desire to sort of write everything down. 
And so there are these models and mathematical models to describe systems that have 10,000 or 100,000 variables, right? And therein lies madness, right? Because you can never write down all of the variables. And so it turns out that the most important thing is to figure out what are the most important variables. And if you figure out what those are, we call them the relevant variables. Those are not only the things that you can see and measure most easily, actually, but they're actually also the control parameters of the problem, of the system. So if you have a system, you know, like markets, and you can write down the control variables, that's super powerful. If you can write down the control variables of the economy, you know what to change in order to make things better, and you don't if you don't. So I've spent much of my career focusing on identifying what are the most important variables and explaining what that tells us often by hiding some of the math because others uh, in many cases didn't follow what the other part of the math was, but trying to explain how we can make things better by recognizing and controlling the key variables of the problem. And that's what is my context complexity science is about. There are many tools that people use in complexity science. There's a whole bunch. People study networks and they study agent models and they study all kinds of things. But, but the idea is that before you even get to the specifics of the model, which is a mathematical, mathematical description, you first have to figure out what it is that you need to describe. And that's what I tend to focus on. Um, and so let's go to pandemics now. I was working on the evolution of, of, of systems, evolution of, of organisms, say. And I, uh, uh, with a student, we worked on the evolution of pathogens. Hmm. So uh, you, you can call it, you can think about it also like a predator, right? A pathogen is like a predator. It wants to eat you up, right? Um, and, and so... What you have is you have a pathogen and a host, and, and you want to study how, they, how the pathogen is evolving. And what we studied in this particular case was what happens if you add global transportation. So you start from a, a, a model, and I can show you, we, we, we can talk about it uh, very briefly, but you can imagine that there is pathogens around the world, which now sure. is not hard to imagine because we're thinking about it all the time. And you ask, what happens as I add extra flights, you know, from, say, D.C. to Taipei or to uh, Moscow and so on? And it turns out that for a fairly small amount of these long-range routes, there is a phase transition, a transition in the behavior of the system that goes from local extinction events where uh, an outbreak happens that kills locally to global extinction. Now that's pretty scary. Yeah. Okay. And, and the reason that it happens is not just that the pathogen can travel faster, which is kind of obvious because that would give rise to gradually worse and worse diseases. But what happens is that there is a connection to how severe the disease is, how rapidly it spreads, and in principle, how deadly it is. And the connection between those two things means that there is a sharp transition. So it means that you could be in a situation where everything looks okay, and you add a few flat, long range flights, and all of a sudden you're in a regime where there is going to be a global extinction event. And I published this paper in 2006. And in the paper, I warned specifically about Ebola and SARS-like diseases. Hmm. And as you, I'm sure, know, Ebola broke out in 2014. Um, and um, I actually gave a presentation at WHO, the World Health Organization in Geneva that year in January. And in March, it broke out. And I gave a short segment of this talk about this, you know, watch out for Ebola presentation. 
Wow. And, and their jaws dropped. And part of the reason why that happened is that everyone thinks in terms of experience. In mathematics, it's the statistics, right? You, you have the prior experience, and that's going to tell you what the future is going to look like. But in this case, the math tells you that that's not true because you can have very dramatic change in what's going on. And what happened in that year is that Ebola that used to be out in the wilds of Africa, right, rural areas of Africa, got to urban areas. And all of a sudden you had 10 times as large an outbreak. And in fact, it was predicted to be many, many times larger. So there was an Ebola outbreak in West Africa and um, once it got out of control, I got involved because I'd been talking with people in the government about other topics because of the Arab Spring and so on, there were topics I worked on. And, and so I was connected to the National Security Council, to the CDC on healthcare issues, and, and to other organizations. And I basically explained to them that there was a flaw in the approach that they were taking. And that was that they were thinking about individuals that were sick. Hmm. And so an individual would show up in the hospital bleeding and then they would treat them, but they would also go back into the community, try to identify the people that they touched and isolate them. But that's thinking from the individual's perspective. And I explained to them that you have to go to the community level, which means that if you can't control it at the individual level, you go up to the community level, you treat the community as being sick and you go into the community and you identify cases. And, um, it may not surprise everyone on this call that sometimes governments don't react quickly. Um, and, and, and so it was, get, it was really hard to get anything to happen. I had a friend who connected me with a small NGO in Liberia. And, and they put me in touch with people who were on the ground working on Ebola. A couple of physicians uh, that I know for now, they're Ugandan physicians that I've been collaborating with since then. And, and I spoke with uh, one of them and I said, look, you know, um, how are you doing? And they told me. And then I said, well, what about trying this? And they said, oh, yeah, we started doing that three weeks ago. So three weeks previously to this conversation, there were neighborhood teams that started going door to door, mem people in the community who went door to door and identified fever using a you know, remote forehead thermometer and isolating anybody that had early symptoms. Hmm. And, and this is what stopped the outbreak. So it, it went up exponentially. Sorry, I have to plug in my power here. Sorry. Are you good? Um, so the, the outbreak went up exponentially, and it went down exponentially and went to extinction. And all of my colleagues, the people that I were talking to, were saying, no, you'll never get changes in human behavior. No one's going to get anything done. This is going to go to burnout, which is the then equivalent of herd immunity. There were going to be, if you do burnout, 10 million people dead. And we ended the outbreak with 11,310 people who died. Wow. So like one-tenth of one percent of what everyone was predicting. And the reason was very, very clear. It's because the communities took ownership of the problem. They decided that they were going to stop the outbreak. And it's so we learned two things. One is that you can stop outbreaks, which was super important. And the other one is that the action is in the community. Now, today it should be very clear. Most of everything that you have to do in an outbreak is stopping transmission. And stopping transmission is not a government action. It's not a hospital action. It's not a medical procedure. It's none of that. It's all about people doing the action and that everybody else is there in a supporting role. The supporting role may be to provide financial support. It may be provide testing. It may provide medical support for those who are sick, but none of that actually is what stops the outbreak. What stops the outbreak is the choice of people in the community to stop transmission. And that's what matters. So, so that was the experience in West Africa. And, and uh, you know, eventually uh, it was stopped by this method, first in Liberia, and then three months later in Sierra Leone, and the same thing happened and so on. And, and afterwards, I got involved in the Congo when there were outbreaks there. I, I was a member, my organization was a member of the, um, the GORN, which is the uh, uh, WHO Africa Outbreak Response Network. Um, and there I actually got to the, 
got to, uh, again, some frustration because many of the NGOs are the ones that I spoke with. Uh, when I talked with them about empowering the community to stop the outbreak, uh, they kept saying things like, you know, how do I get them to do what I tell them? And, and, and that wasn't the right thing. I said, so I said to them, well, did you ask? And, and, and that just wasn't a question. Um, so we actually set up our own community-based effort in collaboration with the Catholic Church in the east of Congo um, to help with the community response. And the first thing that we did is we asked the community, how can we help you? You know, this is a problem. Uh, what can we do to be of help? And, um, and in any case, that was part of the response. There was also vaccines at the time and all kinds of stuff that were used to stop the outbreak. But the outbreaks were stopped. Now, fast forward, and not that much, because actually this led up to the outbreak. In January of last year, I, I, I hate to say that because I really didn't want this to last for a year, of course. Right, right. Um, uh, um, uh, I was called up by Nassim Taleb, who's a colleague of mine and collaborator, and, um, and he said, you got to pay attention to the outbreak. I was working on something else at the time. Uh, and we immediately wrote a paper. It's a one-page paper that basically is all you need to know about what you need to do about this outbreak. Um, and the basic statement is that you have to get ahead of it. It, it. When you have an exponentially growing thing, if you don't get ahead of it, you're you're toast. If you do get ahead of it, and once you get ahead of it, you're done. You can stop it. And, and the main thing is that people are both... Um, they, they both are, are, you know, they don't think that anything can be done. They're fatalistic. Um, and, and so they don't do enough and then they're fatalistic, right? So the point is that you have to realize that you can do something about it. And the way to do something about it is to go all out. And, and if you go all out, that you can actually stop it. And this is what happened with outbreaks of Ebola. It's what happened with outbreak of SARS. It's happened with other diseases. This is not a new thing. It's just not a new thing. But there is much more experience with dealing with zoonotic animal diseases in Africa and in Asia than there is in the US and in Europe and in other countries. So Africa has done an incredibly good job compared to the Western world. And mm -hmm. Asia has done at least many countries in Asia, of course, not all, um, uh, they really learned from SARS. And so they were kind of trigger ready. You know, as soon as they saw that there was something wrong, uh, you know, countries triggered prepared plans and other uh, understanding of how to do things. Um, of course, the U.S. also had prepared plans, but didn't, didn't follow them. But my, my statement would be, a lot of the US and European plans were flawed. And the reason they were flawed is that they somehow believed that having a modern medical system was a solution to the problem. Mm. And as I said before, the medical system is a, is, is a, is a bit player in a pandemic. It sh if you do it right, it shouldn't have very big a role at all. It's a backup, right? To, to, the, to solving the problem. And, and what you really need is public health, public action, leadership uh, inspiration. Um, and there are some places where this has been done reasonably well, right? I mean, so of course, Australia and New Zealand, you know, took the message from China that it was possible to do this. And they say, okay, let's get ahead of this. Um, and, and New Zealand, and I just spoke with uh, Michael Baker a few days ago, who kind of uh, really pushed on the early action idea. Um, there's a there's a decision point. You have to make a decision. It's you you can't do it halfway. Yeah. Right. If you're going to go for it, you got to go for it. If you're not going to go for it, you're going to live with it, and you're going to end up in this case with horrendous things happening over a long period of time. But if you're going to go for it. The main thing is you want to go for it hard because you want to get rid of it fast because the actions that you're doing are hard to sustain. And if they're hard to sustain, what you really want to do is get them over as soon as possible. So if you want to get them over as soon as possible, ah, you have to do them as hard as possible. And everything that you, you sort of try to balance or trade off undermines the whole strategy.
So that's that's really what it's about. So back in so you found out about this. You you were sort of made aware uh, in January, so a year ago now, which is really two solid months before most Americans were even aware. Like unless you were really paying attention to the news, unless you were really sort of paying attention to what was happening, you know, globally. All of a sudden, second week of March rolls around and everybody's being sent home for this first lockdown, right? And everybody's like, what the hell? Like, where did that come from? That was fast. When really it was creeping up on us. There were already conversations. There was already denial, you know, at the government level. There was already, you know, ridiculous statements like, you know, there's only a couple. They'll they'll get better. We'll quarantine them. It'll be it'll be it'll be all good instead of actually facing the problem, right? I, I I feel like what I saw looking back in those first few weeks in January and February, the the little bit that was said at a government level in the Trump administration was almost like trying to, hey, if we don't if we don't look at it, it'll go away, right? Like if we if we don't pay attention to it, it'll just go away. This isn't a big deal. I mean, his press secretary said it, he said it, other people said it. Instead of saying, no, let's let's get after it, like you said, let's get ahead. And what's so wild is that they had they had uh, uh, proof that it could work, right? Whether it was your work, uh, you know, with Ebola in West Africa, like it's already been proven, which I mean, we'll talk more about the plan, this community level plan that is the only way to get rid of it. And the, the very fact that if people listening to this, when it comes out uh, in late January, 2021, that by the end of spring, we could be back to normal if right. we all if we all grabbed onto this. And I, I firmly believe that based on not just, not just theory, like it worked, right? It worked five years ago in West Africa. It's worked in New Zealand. It's worked in Australia. So what, we didn't get ahead of it, right? In March, in April, in February. Um, so why did this idea not catch on? Again, it was out there, whether it was your work, they were already starting to see it happen in other countries. What is it? What is unique about the American experience? And it's not just unique because also like a lot of European countries also failed. But like, what is unique about this American way of doing things that said, "Nah, we're we'll be okay. We'll be okay." So first of all, there is this belief that the way things are will not change. Right? I mean, I've lived this way all my life. There's nothing that's going to change it. Right, and so before the pandemic, this is clear that this is how people thought. I'm living my life, you know, okay, so there's a disease. So it had a big impact in Asia, that's Asia. If it comes here, someone else will worry about it. It was not gonna affect my life. So that's number one. The other thing which is perhaps more surprising is the can't do attitude. Hmm. Right, the US used to be a can do place, right? You know, going to the moon, you know, doing all kinds yep. of incredible things that we've done over the years. And 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 somehow in the last number of years, we've become a bureaucracy. And we can talk about that at length at some point, but a bureaucracy, the main purpose of a bureaucracy is to tell you what you can't do. Hmm. Okay, it lines everybody up into what their box is, and they have to stay in their la- in their box in their lane or whatever it is, because if they do something else, it's violating the structure of the system. And so, so what ends up happening is that we've become a bureaucratized, can't do society. So when everyone says, and, and how do you get ahead in a bureaucracy? Is you tell everybody else they can't do something. We can't do that. So what's happened is that we look at other countries and we say, we can't do that. So, you know, China did it, so we can't do that. It's a a dictatorship. South Korea did it. Oh, we can't do that. It's an Asian country. It's a this country. It's a that country. Australia did it. Oh, they're an island. But Australia has an area that's larger than the continental United States. It doesn't satisfy the qualities of of, of an island, right? But, but there's got to be a reason why, because of two things. Number one, if we didn't already do it, right, we're the best, then, you know, maybe there's some unique reason why they could do it. Uh, and the other reason is that, you know, we just can't do things. Can't do that. And so this has been a tremendously frustrating process because 
for me, as you said, I mean, surely at the beginning, right, we could have taken action and prevented the virus from getting to the United States or to Europe, uh, and we didn't. And as I saw that it was something that wasn't happening, I was going, uh, we are going into the choice of hell. Mm. Right? I mean, we could have chosen the path where things would in fact remain normal, but we didn't. Um, and we chose the path of the horrendous uh, situation. And that's where we are today. Um, but the point is that at every moment in time, including today, if we chose to take the right actions, and there's nothing surprising in what these actions are. We could be, you know, four to six weeks away from normal existence. Hmm. All it requires is us to make a commitment to stop the transmission of the virus. Because the virus doesn't live unless it transmits. And it only transmits when people meet each other. And if you stop meeting each other for a few weeks, then the virus is done for, it's gone, it's eliminated. And you can do that in a town, you can do that in a neighborhood, you can do it in a city, you can do it in a state, you can do it in a country. And ultimately we could do it in the world if we either did it together, if we did it progressively around the world and protected the areas that are, are don't have the transmission at the time. And, and there's nothing that's rocket science about this. This is not a magical, you know, pull it out of the, you know, a special biochemical vat or, you know, which is, you know, a, you know, one way to talk about the vaccines that are, you know, thought to be the cure-all and end-all, which they're not, um, or any other sort of magical technology. No, it's hard work. It's right technology. It's the thing that can enable us to gain the upper hand, to stop the outbreak, and to go back to normal. But it requires a commitment. It's not easy. But given what we've been going through, it's surely a lot easier than what we've been doing for the last almost year. So, so that's what I've been saying. And I haven't said anything basically different. I mean, the pieces of information have all lined up, right? We now have examples of what works and all of the examples that don't work. And the difference between the ones that work and the ones that don't work is the ones that work said, we're going to get rid of this. And the ones that don't work said, we're going to live with the virus. There's no way to get rid of it. We have to live with it. And the living with it is a catastrophe. Cases go up and down. You try to open up because you want to open the economy. It goes up. And then it goes, you have to, you know, you can't, too many people are dying and are sick and it's horrendous. Oh, we have to lock down. So now we lock down and we pay huge price. And we do this over and over again. And, and it's just not the right way to do things. So the point is that all of that is being reactive. It's saying, I'm going to do what I'm forced to do. It's like having a wrecking ball coming to hit you and saying, I'm going to wait until it hits me, hmm. you know, which is what we've been doing. And, and so, again, you get ahead of it. You anticipate it. You say, I'm going to stop it. And, and you do the right thing and, and you're done with it. It is so wild in retrospect, you know, when we when when we went into our like first lockdown in mid mid March, right? When everybody was sent home from work and our all of our cities looked deserted, right? Nobody's on the road, nobody's open, just just you know, uh, uh, grocery stores and stuff like that. I think everybody thought I sort of had an inkling that it was gonna because I know you know I didn't grow up in the U.S. I have a very low view of American exceptionalism and how cool Amer Americans think that they are versus how cool I, I know that they're not. Uh, they're fine, but it's like any other country. It's got good things about it and bad things about it. So I went into it thinking, man, we are not going to do well in this. Like, And unfortunately, I was I was right. And so many people were right that we we could have we could have really taken that bull by the horns, as it were. And stayed home for you know several weeks and done more of a not relied on the government for for you know uh, st stimulus packages and said hey how can we support each other to stay home as long as possible till this thing's done because you just said I mean it's so it's so crystal clear you don't have to be a physicist or any science kind of scientist to understand that this thing stops transmitting when you stop seeing other people That's like right. it stops and it's done. And if we do this for a few weeks, it's over. That is such a simple, my kids understand it. They know what we need to do to get rid of it. And they're six, seven, and eight. And yet we have 
tens of millions of people that have just, like you said, it's just been a, it's been up and down. It's been a seesaw. It's been, you know, we, we do, we start getting better. And so the cities open up, the towns open up, everything opens up. People start going back to different places. They start inviting people into their homes, which uh, uh, to the best of my understanding, that's been worse. That's been most of it, right? Is people coming into close quarters with people that are not in the pod with versus going into a store when you're masked. Like, sure, so you could catch something there, but if you're all masked or if you're in a restaurant to pick up takeout, like probably not going to happen there. It's because you're inviting all your homies over um, and they're in, they're in a bunch of different pods, right? And so it's been a very frustrating year. And right now we're trying to, you've been doing it for a long time. And we sort of started working together a few weeks ago. We're trying to re-push this effort, which we've sort of branded COVID zero. You know, it's the belief that within a few few weeks, we could get to COVID zero. Explain for people, you know, you've already alluded to a bunch of the different factors. And again, it's so simple how, how, to, how to get to COVID zero. How do we get to COVID zero? And explain, let's talk for a minute, because this is going to be one of the pushbacks. It's been in the few weeks we've worked together, the people I've talked to, the biggest pushback is money. How do I, I've got to go to work. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. The government isn't helping. And there's all these excuses for why we can't stay home. And so since I know people listening are thinking, what about the money? What about the money? We've only gotten, you know, $2,000 total, not even, uh, since this, since this whole thing started. So how do we do this? And let's spend a few minutes talking through how we need to not rely on the government and we need to rely on each other. The, this kind of mutual respect, this mutual humanity of the people that we can like see, you know, from our homes, right? We can all help each other stay home. So the first thing is to understand time because time is the most important variable. If we have to do this for months and months and months, it's very hard. Mm-hmm. And that's what we've been doing. But if we have to do it only for four to six weeks, let's say six weeks, it's not that long. So it's super important to realize, and, and, and six weeks, maybe you have to add a few weeks to opening up gradually, you know, okay, so two months, a little bit more, but two months is very different from six months or 12 months. And, and the other part of it is, again, that it's, it's about investing in the future, right? If you do, if you spend money for six weeks, but then you go back to normal after eight weeks, then it's a huge benefit right? The repayment afterwards is much greater than the cost that you incur up front. So before anything else, we have to understand that there is a tremendous payback for the initial investment of getting to zero. The second part of it, otherwise, we're going to be in this in this sort of hemi hazy, you know, semi mostly, you know, lockdown situation for the next six to 12 months at least, and worse if we have these new variants and all kinds of other craziness. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so that's number one. Number two, given that it's a short period of time, there's real opportunity for people to help each other. And I just learned today that there was apparently, uh, in Turkey, they had a program where people would just pay blindly for each other's electrical bill. Hmm. You know, they, they didn't know who they were paying for and, and people didn't know who was paying their electrical bill. I mean, people have a hard time. There are definitely people who cannot get past six weeks. Sure. And, and that holds for, for workers, for people who are working, who don't have the income, and it holds for people who are, have businesses and need to run a business and they can go bankrupt or, and, 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 and so on. But, but the point is that on the scale of things, it's not that much, right? I mean, it would be good if the government understood this and did this the right thing for the six weeks. I mean, we just had, what is it, a $2 trillion bill that's being proposed and who knows how much it'll end up with. And last year, we had a huge amount of money that went into supporting people during the, the outbreak. And if we just focused on a short period of time, it would have been much cheaper, not much more expensive. But given that it is what it is, Some people need help. And super important to realize that nobody knows who needs help better than the community itself. Mm. The government doesn't know who really needs the help, right? That's surely true. So the most important thing is for people to reach out to each other, 
to figure out who really needs the help and help them pass the crisis. And this is what people should do for each other. This is what the community is for, right? That we have other people that can share with us the challenge of getting through a crisis condition, because once we do that, we will all be better off because having everyone make it through enables us to go back to life that we want to have. So some people are saying right now, listen, Nick, Yanir, we're 11 months in, we're tired, we're exhausted, and the vaccines are coming. Yeah. The vaccines are coming. And 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 I'll, I'll say this up front because if not, I'm going to get a ton of shit from people. Like, I'm for vaccines. Like, I take my flu shot every year. Anytime they say there's a vaccine here to help you, I'm in. Like, pump it into my veins. But I, I do that. I take my flu shot every year knowing that there's a 50% chance I can still get the flu. Like, That's I trust the science. I trust the shot. I'm not not taking it. We all get it. But I have to know that they're not the end-all, be-all, as you put it earlier. So for the person saying we're this far in let's just get to the vaccines then we'll, i mean dude didn't fauci just yesterday dr fauci say he 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 ex i think it was in the first or second press conference like i'm he expressed uh that i'm not sure these vaccines are going to be very effective on these new strains that are coming out of the uk out of south africa and other places like so we're already at the point in the pandemic where the vaccines they've been working on and we've spent billions of dollars making might not actually affect these potentially more deadly, more lethal strains of the virus. So anyway, address, I, I, I started answering it myself, but I want you to, you're well, the expert. I got here. it. I mean, let, let, let me just repeat a couple of the things you say. But before I talk about that, the first statement is that even if we didn't have all these other issues, the vaccine rollout process, right? They're talking about 100 million vaccines in 100 days. When does that mean we will have enough people vaccinated in the ideal circumstance where vaccines work and, and we can stop the virus that way, it still would take six to 12 months. So we're talking about six to 12 months where we have 3,000 to 4,000 people dying per day. And that's also not including all of the long COVID, which is people who are gonna have long-term disability and, and, and for those who don't know, right, SARS, which is the most similar disease, people 10 years later cannot work. They have long-term disability, uh, which is very difficult. And so what we're doing, and, that, and that's for, for, for this, for the coronavirus is, is, is at least 10% of people who get, you know, even mild cases. Um, so, so what we're talking about is a horrendous cost in, in, in lives and in health but also a horrendous cost in economics, right? I mean, we cannot open up the economy for six to 12 months without um, uh, getting rid of the virus. It just doesn't work. So um, for those of you who are tired, uh, you're gonna get a lot more tired uh, if we don't take the right action. And the right action may seem hard, but it's really a lot easier, right? I mean, you have to, so, so there's a, a way of thinking about it, right? I mean, the, when you have a fire, you don't live in a burning building, you put it out. And if you're tired, you don't sit there and wait until it burns your house down, right? What you do is you put it out. Uh, you, you really have to think about it as we need this short-term action, we can do it. It's actually not as hard as people think, you know, it's, it's not muscular effort, it's actually sitting at home and being patient. It's just a little bit of patience that is really what matters. And, and of course, taking care of people is a super important part of it. But now let's go back to what you were saying. So it's six to 12 months. If we don't do the right action, if we don't get rid of the virus, but even then it's a much more dangerous situation than we think. So the problem is that we actually are facing a much more serious issue with the new variants. And, and that's because the new variants can have properties like they transmit faster, they are more severe, and also they're different enough from the standard variant that the vaccine won't work for them. Because what the vaccine is doing is it's teaching the immune system 
how to you know, to recognize the virus. But if the virus changes, then it taught them to recognize something that they don't have. So it turns out that all of those three things seem to be happening. So the British variant is transmitting faster. It is just today we learned likely more severe. And at, at the very least, the South African variant seems to be escaping at least partially the uh, vaccine. And not only that, it means that people who have already gotten the disease, many of them will, be, will get the disease again. So the, the new disease is like a new disease. It's just a new, it's a, it's a different virus. And that's super scary. So, um, and, and the speed of transmission is sufficient that the new, new variant doubles every 10 days relative to the old variant. So if our hospitals are overflowing, in 10 days, they would be double the number of people. And in another 10 days, it would be four times as many people and then eight times as many people. So there's just a tiny fraction of the people will be able to get medical care because right now, many of our hospitals particularly in certain parts of the country are overflowing. So that's really bad and that's gonna happen fast. That's like, you know, March. It's not like next year, you know, it's not like the summer, it's not like whatever. Um, and, and so what that really means is that we're gonna be again up against the wall. We're gonna to have to do something more because, you know, having that many people hospitalized, that many people dying, I mean, I would have preferred if we reacted a long time ago and said it's it's too much that's happening now. But the, this is, but the situation is that um, we really have got to react to the fact that this is going to get a lot worse. And and the vaccine is, the point is that if you have already variants that you know of that are escaping the tra the vaccine. I mean, there are millions, billions of variants out there among all of these viral particles and all of all of these people. And the whole point is that the ones that will spread are the ones that will evade the vaccine. So imagine that you shut out, you take a vaccine and you stop this set of viruses, you know, these ones that are close enough to what the vaccine is telling you. But now you've spread out past that. And so they're present. They don't have to be the fastest. They don't have to be the most lethal, but, but, but they're the ones that are going to get past the vaccine and everyone's going to get sick with those. And that's what happens with the flu. So all of this idea that we can somehow stop this with a vaccine and live with the virus in a reasonable way just doesn't make that much sense. But if we work together and we take the strong action, reduce the number of cases, then first of all, there's less virus, there's less mutation, there's less variants, and the vaccine can be used in a targeted way. It's called ring vaccination. You target the people who are more likely to be sick, and then you stop the transmission. And you can also use mass testing that we're much better than we used to be before in order to reduce the number of cases by identifying who's sick, because we can do mass testing. So what you do is you have this fight. We're in this fight, we're gonna use all of the tools that we have, we're gonna get rid of it and we can go back to normal. And if the alternative is we kind of sit back and say, you know, hey, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know whether I can, bad news. One of the very frustrating parts about the last few months has been ex hearing people, and I don't know if you have these kinds of people in your close, you know, in close proximity to you. But I have quite a few people, including members of my own family, uh, not my immediate family, but my, you know, my brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles, that there's this weird, like Americans are wildly and oddly okay with people dying, right? We're, it's, we're very much a culture of that's okay with, obviously all of us die and we should be okay with that. But we're, 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 we're very much a, we're a pro-war country. We're a pro-death penalty country. We're a pro, we're a pro, we're a pro lot of things. We're pro, we're pro police brutality because we don't do enough to stop it. Like there's so many things that we're okay with. And I just had an interaction on Twitter actually today. I shared this morning that, you know, Dave Chappelle is got COVID 
And, you know, Dave's been doing uh, these like shows in, you know, I, I presume everybody, you know, they're socially distanced and masked up, blah, 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 blah. But he's been doing these shows in Austin, these comedy shows. Um, and so there's a photo of he and Elon Musk and Elon Musk's partner Grimes and Joe Rogan and someone else. And uh, so after that, and, and so Grimes had it a couple weeks ago. Grimes got COVID a couple weeks ago. Less than two weeks later, she's in Austin at a comedy show, maskless, with Joe Rogan and Elon Musk and Dave Chappelle, who got got COVID. And so I just shared it and th- and said a few said a few choice words about how just wild how wild this is. Like, how is this happening? How is this our reality? And someone replied, and I've heard this, I say all that to say this, like someone replied with something that I've heard so much and it bothers me so much. They said a bunch of things that were just asinine and very uninformed, but they said, we're a country of 330 million people and less than a half a million people have died. Basically, big whoop, like this isn't as deadly as they're telling you that it is. And I literally stopped in my tracks because I've, it, it hit me differently than other times, but it hit me, but it it just hit me so severely that someone just told me, one of my fellow countrymen just told me that big whoop, that 400,000 people and counting have died from this virus. And that to me, I think contributes to, I I don't know New Zealanders, Kiwis very much. I don't know Australians. I I, I mean, I have friends from those countries, but like it just, it's so wild to me and it's also not surprising to me how we're in this mess, why we didn't take it seriously, why there are that person that interacted with me this morning is is one of millions of people maybe in this country that would say it's only been 400,000. They said, I mean, the president, and I know where they're learning it from, our former president now said, they said, it was, Fauci said it was going to be 2 million. Look, it's way less than that. And that just bothers me. That hurts my heart so much that people would think that way about like, no, 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 every life lost is valuable. And I know this hits close to home. Back in May, you shared that you lost your mom from COVID. Sure. Like, how do we, almost everybody I know, and obviously you took it seriously before that, and I'm so sorry for your loss. And I I've, I feel it's, at this point, I've had to say that so much this year with people that I know. But how do we get people to not have to have someone to to pass away from this virus to care? And I, so, so I think that, so I, I don't know how to answer your question in a strong way, but I can okay. share some thoughts. First Please. of all, we have definitely become a spectator society, right? We watch TV, you know, there's known to be this, you know, we're, People watch something, you see it on TV, and then you see it on the street, and you don't react to it, right? Mm. Because, because you've accepted you're a spectator. And, and you know, we watch horrendous things happening on TV, right? So, so there is this loss of this desensitization because it, it's become unreal to us. And it, and it doesn't help that there are so many numbers, right? That big numbers are anything desensitizing, right? Because the, when you count something, you can't tell the difference between, you know, um, whatever, uh, grains of rice and human beings, right? I mean, it's just a number. Um, and, and there's this loss of this ability to, to, to recognize the unique value, and this is one of the other things that we talked about earlier, the unique contribution and value of each person. And this is true because of how we think about people, but it's also true because of sort of the industrialized world that values people by, you know, what work they do, you know, how many, you know, toothpaste tops do you screw in per hour, right? I mean, this is the, the, um, the, the nature of how people have been talking about people. Um, and, and then you go to a little bit more problematic piece, which is that um, there surely are a lot of people that won't have that attitude about someone who's close to them. 
Mm. There are people who they love and there are people who love them and there are people who depend on them and people they depend on that they surely don't want to be harmed. Uh, they don't want them to die. They don't want them to be disabled. They don't want them to be in a hospital sick for months. They don't want those terrible things to happen. Um, but, but indeed, there is a distancing. There is a distancing from people that are far away, and there is also a distancing from people who are nearby. And, and rebuilding the, the caring that we have for others is something that is an important part of what hopefully we will do uh, in the context of suffering this tremendous loss. At the very least, we should learn a lesson that uh, there are other people that we care about. Now, um, there's one other thing that I would say is that part of this or a little bit of this is real, but a lot of this is also part of a fantasy world that has been created for us by TV and the press talking about things that are unacceptable as if they're acceptable and creating this model of our society, which is not true. When people actually do polls about what people want to do, they say that they want to do strong action, that they want to save lives, whether it's 80% or 90% or what is the number, it's different polls are showing different things. Mm -hmm. But it's really not a large percentage of people that are indifferent to the conditions of other people. And, and I do think that we've lost a huge amount, not because people are uncaring, which you might which we might think, but actually because we've elevated that idea of our own nature, hmm. which I don't think is true, at least not very common. And by elevating it and by appealing to it, we've actually reinforced it. As we, we people choice about how to behave and even how to think is remember, we talked about this in the context of education, is guided by the expectations that we have of them. Mm -hmm. And we've created the expectations. And, and, and that happens when we appeal to the worst in people. And we appeal to the worst in people when there are people who want the worst in people to be show up. And that's what we've allowed to happen. It's not that people are that way fundamentally, because everybody under most circumstances or many circumstances cares a lot about other people. But there are some circumstance where we can make a condition under which they will be indifferent. And there are experiments that show this and so on. So the difference is that if someone stands up and says, we can do this. If someone stands up and says, uh, we care about each other. And so let's make sure that other people are not harmed. People behave differently. People think differently. People are different than when someone stands up and says, you know, it doesn't really matter. And so it's not really just about how people are. It's about which parts of people we expose, we sh that, that show up in the context of our conversation. And so, the, the, the opportunity is, and, and, and this is the opportunity that has been found, and including in the United States, including when leaders in the United States stand up and say, we're in this together, we can do this, we can solve the problem. Uh, that's when we draw on the best of us. And yes, 
everyone has, you know, different parts and you can expose and you can appeal to the worst in people. But we have the choice. We have the choice both for ourselves, but we also have the choice when we talk to others, whether we think about and appeal to the best in them uh, or the worst in them. That is so helpful. I mean, especially in this social media age, right? I think one of the worst things that happened over the last four years, um, and it's not even to point fingers at this point, because again, we're all, what you're talking about is we're all capable of being super terrible or bring out the best in each other, right? But looking back on these last four years, we are, I think, much more polarized than any time in my short lifetime. And that was because whether you like him or not, Donald Trump brought out the worst in everybody. He was constantly criticizing, constantly calling things, constantly berating people publicly. And it brought, I think that helped people, that helped people act that way toward each other, right? We didn't, now people made the wrong choice. They could still choose for themselves, right? I'm not, I'm not absolving people from, oh, Donald Trump did something bad. And so now we can do something bad, but there's something very critical about our leaders standing up and modeling for, because we do, we, we admire politicians, whether we should or not. And, and there's, you know, varying degrees of that. We shouldn't idolize them. That's for sure. We shouldn't put them on a pedestal. They're not gods, they're public servants, but we do sort of look to them. Uh, and whether maybe it's musicians, maybe it's, maybe if you're into food, like your favorite culinary chef, we have these people that we look to and we're hoping that they can guide us, right. And give us a model for how to do this. Well, in the last four years, we, made a lot of bad decisions, even as even me as a, a left leaning, you know, millennial, like I made a lot of decisions with how I treated other people. And that came because I made a poor choice. I was seeing something modeled and I wanted to combat that with the same exact thing, but on the other side, like that doesn't work. And so we're not making any progress. Right. I think I want to hope that if, if and maybe other leadership was in place and maybe, maybe you, would think differently if other leadership was in place back last year, back in January, February, March, that maybe we'd be in a better place because there'd be more talk of, we can do this. We can do this unity, wear your mask, listen to the science, stay away from each other, stay home. And, you know, not doubting of the science, not, you know, constantly casting doubt on all these things that we're doing. Um, what do you think? Do you think it could have been differently or no? So I, I, I can't say, you know, because you know, you you ask me, would it have been different? And 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 that's not an answer. I mean, I can't answer that with my tools, right? Sure. With my science right now. One of the problems with having leaders, and this is a structural problem, is that the people who want to be leaders tend to be selfish people. Mm. It doesn't mean that they all are but there surely is a tendency for that to happen. So the question is, how do we deal with that? And, and the answer is we have to revisit what we want to be both the models that we have for ourselves and the actions that we want for society to take. And we're super frustrated. And I don't blame necessarily the people who uh, all of the people who voted for Trump, right? I think there's a tremendous frustration about the fact that the government and the governance has been ineffective for us. Hmm. And the seeking out of alternatives that will be better. And there's a deeper question here about how we can have government and governance that is effective that the most important thing is to go back to this idea that says everyone has unique contribution that they can make. And if we focus our attention on enabling people to make their best contribution by providing a context in which it can be successful, it can be effective for them to achieve their fulfillment, of their identity, then it changes the nature of the society that we have to be a society that we truly depend on each other because if I wanna do what I want to do and you wanna do what you want to do, then we complement each other in a very different way. 
And so there's an opportunity to go in a different direction with society, a society that cares about individuals and not about numbers, not about the number of people. Uh, and so it changes totally the question. We knew that when we were together on the farm, right? Because there we depended upon each other, we cared about each other, and it's a little bit trivializing things to say that, I'm aware, but the nature of the relationship was much more intense and intimate. Um, and, and now we don't have that. So there is a, we're fighting a virus, but at the same time, we're fighting the society that we've become. And so parts of the questions are number one, can we get together to eliminate the virus? And the other question, which is deeper, is can we learn from this experience to actually transform our society, mm. to be the society that we want it to be, one that cares about each of us and therefore enables everyone, including ourselves, but also, of course, the people that we care about, um, to, to live in the world that we want to live in. And there's one more thing that I want to say about your statement. Um, it's really important to remember that each of the lives that is lost, the people who are not here, we lose their voice. Mm. If we remember, sorry. No, please. If we remember that there was a possibility that they would have still been here, that we would have still been able to hear their voice it is the difference between a world that, w that doesn't have our loved ones and the loved ones of other people that we know and their loved ones that compared to what we have today that we have to appreciate. And that's, that's the essence of caring about people. Mm. I thank you for sharing all that. I'm encouraged by that. I feel, I feel, hopeful. I, I've said this multiple times on calls with you over the last month, and I've said it, you know, behind your back, you know, with Cifer, that like, I've been encouraged that our conversations and our work together and the continued work that we'll do isn't just about, you know, what you'd expect from a scientist, you know, facts and data and, you know, all of that. There's, there's, there's very much a human component there. There's very much a, you, you also offer so much wisdom, you know, uh, in terms of how to, treat each other and love each other and care for each other. And I think that's an important balance. I, I think that's why I want, I want to help elevate your voice because you have so much critical knowledge and wisdom to share. Um, and not just for this pandemic, like there will be others, unfortunately, the, at, you know, going back to your complex systems and, you know, crossing oceans and everything going back and forth and everything moving so much faster these days, it's only going to get, it's only become faster and faster, right? We're going to fly across the ocean faster in the years ahead, and we're going to get places faster, which means disease will travel faster. And so I'm, I'm excited for, you know, your continued contribution, not just to the world of, you know, science, but also to, um, helping us become better humans. So I'm, I'm very grateful for you sharing all the things that you have. Um, Thank you very much. Let's, let's wrap up with this. Uh, and I know you've said a ton and you've shared, you know, you've given me so much time. Um, thank you for sharing your story and your work and all that. But I, this is a good, in my mind, this will be a good way for us to wrap up and kind of summarize everything sure. we're doing. And before I ask it, for everyone listening, if you want to get more involved in taking this pandemic by the horns and saying, 
whatever, whether the government helps or not, whether outside forces help or not, we're going to do it here. Um, we have check out the show notes and also go to COVID zero dot us, go to end coronavirus.org, go to nexi dot, uh, com or org, nexi dot org, nexi dot edu. Um, there's so many great risks or just Google Yanir Baryam and you'll find just a wealth of resources to uh, learn not just about pandemics, but about how specifically we can get to COVID zero, which is ultimately what this last hour and a half has been about. But again, I'll include all that in the show notes. When I share it on social media, we'll share all the links there. Please, please get involved. We need your voice wherever you live, whatever you're doing, you can help influence your community to get to COVID zero uh, much sooner than, than right now is currently projected. So this last question is, I come to you, Yanir, and I say, Yanir, I believe in what you're doing. I just bought you a billboard in every city uh, in, in the world. Like every city in the world gets to hear one message from you. Obviously on a billboard, you're trying to get big, you know, big type up there, quick, clear messages. People are driving by really quickly. If I said that to you and got you a billboard everywhere, um, and it, it may, maybe it's not even about the pandemic, but obviously that's what we're all thinking about. Like what one message would you send every, what did you say, Nick, put this on there. I know what the message is, put it on there, send it around the world. So, so the problem is that you remember that I'm good at some things and you're good at some things and thinking about the messaging part, <laughs> I'm sure you're much better at it than I am. So what I would say is the following, um, it, you know, maybe I would say we can do it with some COVID zero or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, um, we can COVID zero or something like that. But, but, but my statement is indeed, I think we have the ability to do it. I think the steps are not that hard stopping mm -hmm. transmission, identifying cases early, you know, isolating people carefully and all of the stuff that we know there's none of it is super sophisticated. We have to do travel restrictions. That's essential. We're learning that the hard way and we can't get away without doing that. So, so we need to do these things. They're not rocket science. We can do them. Um, we just have to make a decision that we can do it. Yeah, I think that's ultimately what it would be after, you know, knowing you this past month, being really involved in your work, and then would just be about like, we have to decide to do it, right? Like that's it is like, you have to decide to do it. It's a hard thing, but life is full of hard things. Just, I don't know, kind of the, 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 the Nike thing, like just do it. Like we know the right thing to do. If anybody listens to this and still denies that we know the path forward, I can't help you at that point. Cause it's so crystal clear. It's worked in other pandemics. It'll work in this pandemic. Um, yeah, you just got to decide to do it. You just got to decide to do it. Absolutely. Yanir, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for your story, for your wisdom, for your work. Um, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you too. Thank you for doing this. Dear friends, thanks for joining Yanir and me today. If you're on Twitter, follow Yanir at Yanir Baryam. He has a wealth of information on all things COVID-19 and so much more. Visit letsgiveadam.com for all things Let's Give a Damn. There's so much there to check out, so much more to come. And lastly, thank you all for listening. I'm truly honored that you come back week after week to listen to these conversations. And I'm glad you're here for all that is developing in the Let's Give a Damn world. Please keep coming back, so much to come. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. The music is by our friend Propaganda. You can reach out anytime and for any reason at hello at letsgiveadam.com. I love you all. Be safe. Keep giving a damn. Bye for now.